Hi, everyone. This is Edward Miro again over here on stage two. Uh, before I announce the next speaker, I uh, just want to thank the sponsors again for this year's Diana Initiative, MongoDB, Microsoft, Verizon, Salesforce, Amazon Information Security, eLearn Security, Intel, and Remediant. A couple other things I just want to remind you of. If you're not taking advantage of some of the expo hall things that are going on, you want to check that out. There are sponsors there that are running contests or giving away swag. Um, there are red team talks going on all kinds of raffles and there's badge workshops so there's just really so much to do uh, make sure you're taking advantage of the raffle prize so it's my distinct honor to announce the next speaker base 16. Uh, base 16 is the founder of dc919 she's a b-sides rdu volunteer a founding member of kakalaki con and incident response security analyst uh, her talk is secrets of the second factor and if there are any is there any time if there's any time at the end we will do questions if not, we will uh, direct you all to a breakout session. So take it away, Base 16. All right. Thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, yeah, so this is Secrets of the Second Factor, aka uh, Threat Hunting and MFA Logs. So um, just a little bit more about who I am. There's a brief introduction there with like the, um, the day job. I'm an incident response analyst specifically for um, inside a company. So not responding to any customers or anything like that, responding to my own company stuff. Um, nights and weekends, I'm a hack coordinator. Um, and then I'm the expert in one room. Um, so I'm just the person that can Google this information the fastest on my team. And that's why um, I'm kind of like the expert now on this. Um, but it's only that one room. So I go to conferences like this and I try to take it to a larger room because when I feel like maybe I'm the expert or I'm the only one in the room that understands something, I want to go to a different room and I want to understand more. I want to teach other people and things like that. Um, I want to point out that I do not make a commission. I only mention vendors as it is convenient. Um, I had access to certain tools that uh, you know, were just very convenient for me, so I use those uh, purely out of con convenience. It's not an endorsement. I don't really one way or the other. Um, I just don't have really deep pockets to go do research on like more than one vendor really. So um, I'm hoping that all this can apply to different vendors, but I might not be able to answer specific vendor questions. Uh, so giving you a brief overview of what the heck this talk is all about, um, I'm gonna do a brief introduction to MFA 101, just make sure that we're all level set there on it. Um, I'm gonna get into what they tell you, basically what do the vendors tell you, what does um, the rest of the internet tell you and like other professionals in the area, like conversations that I have seen happening already um, about MFA and then I'm gonna get into what I haven't seen conversations about, what I haven't seen the vendors talk about and then I'm gonna get into discovery time, the things that I found in my own like environment, um, kind of mix that in with a couple other stories from the, f the handful of people that I was able to talk to that have seen some things around this as well. Um, and then I'm going to get into some points about how you can fix this and how you can have a good MFA implementation um, in your own organization. So just to level for the purposes of this talk, um, MFA or multi-factor authentication, second factor authentication, I'm going to use those interchangeably, um, is used after the password is correct. There are some implementations where you can put your code in line with the password, but that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. You have to have a correct password first and hit that level of authentication before being requested um, on a device. And for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna consider MFA is a phone call, an SMS message, or you're getting a push sent to a phone app, and then you have to push that accept button um, on that phone app. And then MFA is security. Um, it's something that everybody talks about as, you know, you got to have that second factor. You got to have that extra layer, that defense in depth. It's your security plan. Um, so kind of moving on, I kind of want to give you an idea of the flow of how the heck MFA actually works when you go through and you enter your user name, patient or service. Um, it then goes to your first factor authentication uh, after it goes through a proxy. And this is gonna be your Active Directory, your Radius, your whatever you have set up um, in the environment. Um, it then you know, passes through a firewall and goes to a cloud service, such as Duo, um, where it then sends that signal to the phone, it passes it back, and it passes it to the application. It's just kinda, 
And then moving on to some of the things that you've probably heard about and that they've told you before, uh, problems are mitigated by this system. Um, it mitigates any problems with the password policy. Um, if people are saving their their text, their passwords in plain text files somewhere on the system, and somebody's able to read that the whole Post-it note um, under the keyboard, uh, you know that second factor gives you that um, credential harvesters asterisk asterisk to a degree. Um, so also where the uh, MFA is seen uh, in the threat model is something that they tell you it's all about, you know, prevention, preventing that account access, or it's mitigating, it's mitigating that, that password policy. Um, so, so this is where it lies in the current threat model where it's generally being discussed um, out in the open and everything. And then that leads to, you know, pretty graphs and charts like this where, you know, we can see how effective it is, um, you know, having an on device device uh, prompt attempt or an SMS code and how effective it is against us. Um, I'm going to give you a minute to kind of absorb this slide. I know that I talk really fast and I actually give myself speaker notes to take a pause um, and let people kind of absorb information a little bit while I take a drink. Kind of moving into the things that um, they don't tell you, or I haven't really seen discussed um, a whole a whole lot when I go out looking for different things on MFA or um, in conversations. Um, problems persist, it, even though you have an MFA system set up. Uh, people will still try to brute force. Um, imagine your phone constantly ringing for that second factor authentication. If somebody gets a password list and is able to um, get past that password, then is going to keep trying to authenticate, push messages, phone calls, things like that. Um, do your users know how to report uh, brute force against getting these phone calls continuously or keep getting um, codes sent to their SMS? Um, man in the middle are uh, credential harvesting sites um, where they can quickly use the information where, um, you know, just um, social engineering phishing sites uh, of that nature. Um, another thing that you have to consider uh, is user lockout and or bypass. Um, what if a user doesn't have access to their phone or access to their device? Um, an admin needs to be able to issue them a bypass code. And how does the admin validate who they who they are, who they say they are? Um, you know, they could social engineer your uh, security staff, you know, say that they forgot their phone that day and then the, they need a bypass code. Um, how are you going to distribute those codes? You know, are they going to be a one-time use? Are they going to have a um, timeout? Um, things like that. Another thing that when you introduce, you can also introduce more um, problems to your environment. Um, you can instill a false sense of security to, to some of your workers. Um, you know, they feel like they can click on anything or got a whole bunch of stats about um, MFA will protect their account. Um, but we know that's not true, that you can still fall for phishing attacks, the man in the middle, things like that. Um, it can be used as password validation. If somebody gets a hold of a credential dump, uh, they can use you know a couple of passwords in there. And as soon as I see that prompt for that second factor, they know what your system is. And then they can silently um, not cause that second factor to, to follow through. Um, so that can be so they can do further research and then come back later and try to exploit that multi-factor system or um, exploit that application that they're trying to log into to see if there is a way to bypass that, that trigger or that call to the um, multi-factor um, completely. Uh, the other thing that you can have happen is an incorrect implementation. Um, as you roll out multi-factor system, uh, the application owners might have to set some certain configurations um, in their application in order to do that authentication and be compliant in order to make the correct calls um, out to the multi-factor. Um, you know, they might set up their application in such a way that, um, you know, it, it passes the test from the security team one time, but then they go back in and make a configuration change later. And they're suddenly allowing local authentication instead of uh, using that um, single sign-on so they're now bypassing or um, not re requiring that second factor. And your security security team might not be aware of that. Um, 
So uh, moving on to the threats itself against the system, uh, I kind of went out and I asked my red team friends, you know, what do you you do when it's supposed to you know protect these systems so well is red team still able to get into accounts and they said one of their favorite things is when they're going out and doing a pen test against a company where they're rolling out their mfa system for the first time they find those people that are like pto or um, not around and they have to go and they focus on those people to get their passwords and then the system, because it's brand new, they haven't, the actual user hasn't enrolled their personal device yet. It then asks them for enrollment because the password was correct. So second factor is not set up yet. The red team just adds their red team phone to that person that they've managed to pop. Um, the actual user doesn't notice because they're on vacation or whatever, uh, kind of some sneaky tactics there. Um, another thing that you can have happen, I already mentioned was the uh, brute force notification or calls. Um, your us users get exhausted just having their phone ring. They just want it to stop. So they click the button and say, yes, go ahead, sure. Um, if they don't have a way to report um, fraud or to report spam or anything like that happening, um, you know, they're, they're just going to accept, just to make it stop. Um, and then the other thing that can happen is you can DOS um, an MFA server. Uh, uh, if it is set up in a fail open configuration. So if we kind of go back to our idea of the flowchart here, um, where it goes, uh, where the user tries to authenticate into an application, it hits the primary um, authentication factor and then uh, tries to reach out to a external um, server to get that second factor. If you were to have local access and maybe be able to set a hosts file or maybe be able to to change internal DNS records um, and you cause that connection to the external um, validation server, you can have a fail and, and the system is set to fail open. Um, it just bypasses the second factor completely. So that's um, another threat against things that they don't tell you um, or the things that I haven't heard talked about a whole lot is that there are logs. <laughs> These MFA systems are, are logging um, all the time, and you can go in and you can read those logs. Why do we want logs? Well, logs tell me things. Um, I, I like to listen to logs. I like to go out and explore and, and see what they have to say to me and see what they have to say about what my users are doing and what's going on in the company and what, what sort of systems um, are going wrong or haven't been inspected or not put in place correctly. So listen to your logs. Um, I'll, I'll kind of show you what I have learned from the logs and how I've learned to listen to them. So kind of like the the first step in the um, in the logs is, or first section, is going to be the access device and going through, and sometimes this isn't always clear. Um, certain applications can show up as browsers, even though they're not browsers. Um, I've seen things like the Jabber application show up as Internet Explorer. So its engine is probably running on that, but it's certainly not IE. Um, and then other fun thing, end of life. Uh, you can see what version of Windows users are logging in as, you know, go hunt, go find, um, and see if anybody's still running Windows 7, um, if that's expected or not. Uh, the next chunk that I'm going to take a look at here is uh, the device itself. This is the device that the user is uh, authenticating with either a phone number um, or a device name, or it can be both. And then the event type is going to be an authentication. Um, there are event types for admin. Um, if an admin goes in and adds another device, or maybe they remove another device from a user's account, if, the, if you don't have self-enrollment, um, if your IT has to go in and enroll, um, going back and looking through those logs can be interesting as well. Um, and then the factor is how the device was used. So in this case, we see that the factor is a push, and that immediately tells us that this device, that this phone number, is going to be a cell phone, because you can't send a push to a landline. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the next piece in like is, uh, is taking a look at the host. Um, in this case, it's going to be the authentication server, so the server that you are actually doing the authentication against. Not really an interesting detail in this case. Um, integration, I've 
seen different things such as like SSO, which is your single sign-on, um, VPN, your virtual private network, SSH. Um, and then IP is where the traffic came from. And you want to remember that your IP is going to be integration um, dependent. So you're going to need to, to look at IP and integration together. Um, like the IP address that they're coming from when they log into a VPN might be different than after they're inside of your network and then they then leave your network to go do an SSO um, authentication. That IP might change to uh, your company's public IP or something of of that nature. Next piece in log listening, um, again, is looking at the IP address um, and the location, uh, but that location needs validation. Um, I used to work as a uh, firewall engineer at an, I at an ISP, um, and I had a customer call in one day and they were saying, hey, um, my business partner is blocking my traffic. They said that my traffic is coming from like Costa Rica and I don't have any business locations in Costa Rica. Can you take a look? And I, I looked at the customer's account and I'm like, that's weird. You're, you're on the New York firewall. What's going on here? And I jumped on that New York firewall. I started doing a packet capture. Sure enough, his traffic is leaving New York. Um, no, no question about it. That IP is physically you know, located and everything going out of a New York firewall. Um, but the registration on the internet, for whatever reason, the ISP still had it registered to Costa Rica block. So um, sometimes those things are really out of whack and they need to be readjusted. I uh, go uh, uh, dub a can for that. Uh, uh, the next is uh, seeing if the user is adding a new device it, with the new enrollment piece. Um, if it's true, they're adding a device there. If it's false, they're not. Um, it can be interesting when you see users authenticating with a brand new device that might set up, set off some alarm bells um, when you go and, and look through this. Um, the, the reason piece is going to be factor dependent and then the result of its success or failure and then actual authentication. Uh, the next little piece in the thing is that they don't, are going to be that you're going to need more data. Um, you can't just look at these logs at face value. As much as they tell you kind of at face value, there's a little bit of supplementation that ha I have found um, is very useful to have when you start digging through these logs. So um, looking at things like the result, like I say, the whole spamming or brute forcing um, your, your MFA, um, you want to have access to that first factor, to those logs too. Take a look at um, you know, AD, your AAA, or your single sign-on logs. Um, see if they were brute forced um, on the first factor, or if they were successful with one shot and where that came from. Um, see if there was more than one user that has experienced saying they're successful. You might have your passwords dumped somewhere um, and need all these users to change their passwords. The next piece to look at, um, is if you have an employee directory, is to incorporate that into your analysis. Um, does Alice, you know, does she have a registered phone number with your company for, for 408? Is that her desk phone? Is it her desk phone in New York? Um, do you even have an office in New York? Does she, you know, take a look at things like that. Um, the next piece is have a, if you have a user device registry, um, did IT issue Alice a Windows laptop? or did they issue her a Mac laptop? And this is really setting off alarm bells in your head. Um, the next piece is if you can do um, an internal NS lookup, kind of going back to the idea of the locations um, might not match up, but if you have um, a way to look up those IP addresses and it comes back and it says, yeah, oh yeah, this is a, the NAT address for a corporate New York office. Excellent, you've proved another point. Um, you've got that second data set to validate your first data piece. And then any sort of other attribution data sources um, that you have or that you can look at. Um, if all else fails, go out and it's not in your user directory anywhere. Um, you have no idea what it is. Um, it, it might even show that it belongs to, um, say you have a contractor and it's their third party contracting company and it's an office somewhere else. Um, finding those extra clues using other data sources. Um, so the next piece is kind of um, 
giving yourself an idea of what is a baseline, what would be normal traffic um, for your users, what would you expect to see? Um, um, how many devices do you even expect your users to have? Um, are they going to have a cell phone? Are they going to have a desk phone? Are they then going to have like a UB key um, or any sort of other authentication methods? Uh, do they have a legitimate reason to have anything else um, on their corporate account? You know, did you issue them a corporate cell phone and they should only be using that? Are you going to allow personal cell phones? Um, how many locations do you expect to be normal for your workforce? Um, are you only expecting to see people log in from the US? Um, you know, is anybody allowed on site? Should anybody actually be using their office landline right now to authenticate? Uh, so that could be interesting things to kind of get an idea of what your, your baseline is, is going to be. Um, so kind of away with the log listening and kind of like the more boring stuff, I'm going to start digging into the stuff that I discovered. Um, this for me is like the real fun going through um, some of these scenarios. Um, some of these are real cases that I actually worked. Some of them I embellished a little bit. Um, some of them I kind of blended together um, with some of the, the local um, security folks in the area where I heard kind of some different stories from them as well. Um, so stepping through this. Um, when I first went out and, and started looking um, after talking to my red team people, um, and the whole concept of, you know, Red Team is adding their phone number to somebody else's account. That's kind of what, what drove me in my directions when I went hunting. So that's kind of what led me to multiple users um, on one phone. So uh, kind of taking a look at these logs and kind of looking at them face value. Kind of, and we're just gonna go through here and we have a device with an extension. Um, it was successful, it was user approved, um, but there's six people on this one phone number. Uh, they're all help desk agents and they're all in Bangalore. Okay, well, let's let's take a deeper dive. Um, it looks like they all have the same manager and they all have the same hire date. Um, we called the phone number an extension and it plays a tone and that's kind of interesting. So let's take that tone and just run it through um, the translator real quick. Oh, it's pressing the number one. Um, automatically. So that's interesting. Um, they have automatic authentication going on for, for the six people to this extension. So let's email the manager. Oh, people are allowed to have a cell phone or a mobile phone on that help desk agent floor. Um, so we're going to go ahead and ship them all hard tokens um, so that they can all use that method to authenticate instead of all sharing a phone that is basically bypassing your multi-factor because it's automatically playing a tone. Um, our next piece is um, we're, we're going to um, investigate into a device that is uh, nicely named for us called Grace's Landline. Um, but three people logging in, we have Trudy, Frank, and Grace. And well, two of those people are not Grace. So what are they doing on Grace's Landline? Um, we'll take a look at the titles here. OK, one's HR, one's sales engineer. And then we have oh, laptop support. That's interesting. So Grace is doing laptop support, but she's doing it in a shadow IT method. She's added tr uh, her phone number to Trudy and Frank's um, MFA system and also written down their passwords. So if she's doing this laptop support and the laptop keeps rebooting, she can just log in as them and doesn't have to worry about it and doesn't have to bother Trudy or Frank. Um, so we kind of ask her manager and talk to people about it. And we take a look at those, those help desk tickets that she was wearing. stamps match those timeframes when they log in. So it's okay. She wasn't doing anything malicious. She was just trying to do her job. Um, we go in and we confirm that, that Trudy and Frank changed their passwords and that we've removed Grace's landline from their accounts. And then we have a conversation with management and we kind of go through and we're like, how can we make this process easier in such a way that we're not compromising Trudy or Frank um, or anybody else in this process. So um, I also give this example because I like to show that uh, you can actually, your users might have the ability to change the name of their, their phone um, in order to make it more convenient for them or just kind of uh, Re rename their device, give it a nickname if they have multiple devices. Um, and this is kind of where uh, I admit when I found this out, I went and I changed the 
the name of my phone uh, on my own device where I log into work. And then um, as I was showing my coworkers how to go in and do this analysis, um, I, I kind of a little guilty uh, trolling that I do here because whenever uh, anybody goes and looks at my logs, they will see that I always log in. Okay. So the next piece is going to be the next thing that I did is I kind of reversed it where I'm looking for one user that has multiple phones. So kind of some examples here. Um, we'll dig in a little bit further um, into Alice here. Uh, she's a manager, an employee. Um, she has three login phones. And phones are actually the same phone number, but they're named different. So uh, looking into it a little bit further, proving out that it's benign, uh, Alice previously had an unlabeled cell phone. Uh, she went out and she got a new iPhone. She previously had an Android. Um, the MFA system had a code update where when she registered her Android phone with that phone number, it wasn't recording the device name on registration, but there was a software update and now it's grabbing that, that name of that phone. She didn't create a custom or anything. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so it just, the, the MFA system decided to relabel it when she re when she re um, brought that in and installed the app on the, the iPhone. So that's benign. Uh, we can move on to it, where we have um, Bob the engineer uh, who's receiving his authentication as a mobile code, a push, and a phone call. Um, we have his registered mobile number and his work number. But when we look at these five login phones, none of them actually match up to what we have on file for him. So this is very suspect. Um, so we also take a look at some of the timestamps for when he's logging in and they're ha happening at all hours of the day. Um, when we contract, contact Bob's manager, we find out that he's outsourcing his work to other contractors. Um, Bob is actually five people and none of these five people we have on record. So Bob doesn't work here anymore. Um, the next piece we're going to look at for kind of deep diving into the logs is to happen plus crazy scenarios. So we're going to look at our user Ivan. Um, we have a mobile a direct a mobile number for him on file and a work number for him on file. Um, we have what looks like his mobile logging in and that is a kind of, um, and then it looks like he's had five um, attempts against his account. So let's take a closer look at that. We're going to verify this out as benign. Um, his login attempts appear to have random timing. Um, there's not any sort of pattern or, or anything to them. Um, he has a successful login after the failures on his on a registered device that, that we know about, so that's good. Um, we're going to go ahead manager, and oh, we take a closer look at that that strange number that we saw attempting to log in. It turned out that he typoed his desk phone number, um, and Ivan's mobile phone was on silent, so he missed a couple of those. Um, uh, pushes as well. So th this is something that I, I, I've seen before where um, the 919 area code uh, often gets kind of typoed. People can typo in the system uh, to 91, which is India's country code. Uh, so, so that's kind of interesting. Um, you can typo these numbers and you can accidentally call somebody with trying to do uh, authentication, especially on enrollment. Um, if that or wrong number actually answers it. It can be on the account and then used again. Um, so that can be a, a benign um, thing for brute force against a fat user uh, calling somebody. Uh, the next piece uh, that I'm deep diving into uh, and that we're going to investigate is um, Faith's account, where um, we don't have any numbers on her on record. Um, for some reason, and she has 27 failed login attempts. So we're, we're going to take a look. There was no response. Um, the login attempts happen exactly five minutes apart to the second. That's very suspicious, probably a script. We're going to email Faith's manager, and oh no, it turns out she's on PTO. Um, 
wherever, whatever number that is trying to authenticate, you know, nobody's paying attention and Faith is definitely not logging in. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go and disable Faith's account. Um, and then we're going to set, set it so that when she comes back from vacation, she can reach out to make sure it's really her and reset her password and get her back logged into the system. Um, and then we're going to take this and we're going to do further follow-up investigation on those login attempts, on those IPs. Those are very weird IPs um, about where she's trying to, about who and what was trying to authenticate in as her and why they were doing it and things like that. So kind of the next piece after uh, the beyond the technology um, that you, you kind of want to think of and some of the scenarios that I may or may not have seen um, are things like uh, assistance, assistance to executives or um, other people in the office, um, people that have a reason to proxy or to, you know, pseudo log in as somebody else. Um, are they getting the username, getting the passwords and then adding their phones to the accounts of these other people and logging in that way? Um, do you have applications that, you know, have proxies in place and built out already so that this doesn't happen? Do you have maybe an intermediary application proxy that will allow somebody to log in as somebody else and to take care of just these administrative tasks? Um, you know, you, you want to be able to set that up. Um, contractors, um, you need to give them the, the access that they need to do their jobs um, and not restrict them to certain things. Um, if you do restrict them, uh, you know, uh, contractors versus employee, and you have managers, um, they, they need to know the that, that manage both. They need to know the levels that contractors are allowed um, and set the expectations accordingly for their work level. Because um, if you expect contractors to do work that they aren't capable of doing, um, where they can't log into a system where only an employee can log into that system, do not be surprised when you see contractor phone numbers on an employee's account um, because they have to log in and do that shadow IT, you know, get that employee's um, password in order to do what they need to do um, for their job. And then also keep in mind the idea of restricted areas or SCIFs. Um, you know, are, if, if they're not allowed a cell phone, um, are they allowed desk phones? Um, do they all have their own individual extensions so they're responsible for their own individual um, authentication? They can't just go to one single phone number in order to log them in um, because anybody that can pick up that phone or if it rings to multiple desk phones at a time, anybody can authenticate for anybody else and that kind of defeats the purpose. So just kind of um, know what can be done there. And then um, the next piece when you do any sort of threat hunting is responding to your findings and some of the uh, I guess suggestions I have for responding to the things that I have found is think about um, no self-enrollment or limiting self-enrollment. How many phone numbers do you let somebody actually um, assign to their account? Um, you know, should they only have a cell phone or a company issued cell phone um, or a desk phone, things like that. Um, it does kind of put a burden on your IT department. So you do kind of have to look at the, you know, IT versus security. There might need to be an ugly conversation there. Uh, but th that would prevent a lot of what I saw um, just by limiting self-enrollment. Um, consider no phone call authentication. Um, wh when you really think about it, if, if somebody steals like a backpack and it has a laptop and a phone in it and that phone is the second factor, um, they don't have to unlock the phone in order to answer a phone call. Um, so, you know, they have a sticky note with a password on the laptop, you know, that, that system's completely compromised MFA or uh, because they can answer the phone call for the MFA. Um, if you do allow phone calls, um, consider uh, authentication res restrictions against the authentication. It, it's a minor slowdown, but if you change the default from, you know, press one to authenticate um, and you change it to like press six, it's just that, that extra step um, that somebody has to take in order to try to bypass that. And then uh, fix what you find. Um, you, you might find systematic things in your environment um, you know, about people sharing accounts and why are they sharing accounts? And, um, you know, it, 
it might not be an easy technology fix. It might be an HR, it might be a culture fix. Um, maybe all your server admins are actually sharing usernames and passwords or you know, keys into certain um, administrative things. And now that there's MFA, that's an extra step where you know, they, they now have to put their phone numbers on all these accounts or um, you know, are all sharing some sort of other authentication factor. So just keep in mind and, and fix what you find um, if you go out and hunt these things. And then the other piece I wanna bring up is um, educating your users. Uh, this goes beyond the password policy. Your users probably know and understand the password policy. You have the restrictions around that. It has to be so many characters, special um, alphanumeric, special character, all that. But do they know, don't share your multi-factor. Don't let somebody else put their phone number on your account things like that. Um, do your users know how to report fraudulent login attempts? Um, is your security or your IT department um, prepared to handle those phone calls or those um, or those emails coming in from users where, hey, uh, I got this MFA push or this phone call and it was weird because I wasn't logging in. Um, make sure that your users know how to do that because they're gonna be probably your earliest detection if something weird's going on. And then you also want to have a safe way for your users to report requests for credential sharing. If their manager comes to them and you know requests that they allow or they give them their password and their their phone number, you know, do you have a culture where that might happen? Is there a a way that that users can report that? Um, think of the especially vulnerable um, contractors working for a contracting company and their um, contract li liaison says, hey, I need your credentials for this company so that I can go in and make sure that you get your paycheck on time. Um, and then once they do that, then that you know recruiting company is now downloading all your internal HR um, records or, or whatever that that user had access to, you know, that, that could be a huge problem. So um, make sure that people can report that. And then of course, um, include contractors. <clears throat> The main thing that, that I want you to take away from this talk and that I want you to take away from, from MFA and the whole secrets of the second factor is um, just do not set and forget your setup. Um, like yes, MFA is a fantastic um, resource for protecting user accounts and everything, but it's totally not flawless. Um, <laughs> I've gone over a lot of the things that, that can happen that can go wrong. Um, I, I encourage you to search for the unusual, not only in, in MFA, but um, in any sort of resource that you have. Um, and then go through and investigate those logs and see what's going on. Bring in uh, other resources, other teams, other different log sources and validate what, what you're seeing people um, in different departments and having like those relationships and being able to, to discover the truth of, of what's going on and then solving systematic problems that could be going on um, in, in your company or be discovered in a system like this. Um, I guess kind of the next piece is just the stuff that, that I want to do future research on. This might be a talk. Um, digging more into how to detect credential stuffing attempts, digging more into soft token, do look into soft tokens. Um, but I'm, I'm really curious to see, you know, um, if that type of stuff is going on, um, if people are able to copy those. I want to look into SMS token brute forcing if somebody's just randomly throwing numbers um, into one of these things. Um, I want to see if if anybody is also trying to attempt to bypass codes um, when like IT or security didn't issue a bypass code to a user. Um, and then one of the other things I want to take a look into is people sharing YubiKeys, hacker keys, or, or hard tokens. Is, is it possible to share those? Um, can they be on multiple accounts and, and things like that? Um, and this slide here is just kind of like, thanks um, to the Diet Initiative, to my employer, um, especially the management for letting me do this research, uh, not, not naming them. Um, and then the, the uh, uh, you know, DEF CON 919, RTP Security Bureau, um, just having conversations with me and letting me know that I'm not crazy for going and digging around in these logs. And then just randomly duo because they had nice flow charts. Um, and then just some references here. And then um, I'll take questions. Hey, can you hear me? 
I, th I think you can. Uh, okay, good, good, good. Okay, base 16. I just want to say thank you so much for that talk. That was incredible. Um, I was just having a conversation with a friend last night who works in incident response, and he was like, I'm currently at dinner trying to convince a bunch of C-levels to enforce MFA and or two-factor authentication. And it's like, well, it seems so self-evident in 2020 that you shouldn't you shouldn't have to explain this it should be it should be so obvious to and to justify the return on investments just like oh but it's crazy um so there's been a lot of really great uh, interaction in the audience people really liked the uh the logs section that was that got a lot of uh, positive and then you have like the the great reference there so i have the theme song dun, 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 in my head okay anyway sorry <laughs> Uh, a lot of love for the case study scenarios. Uh, one question that we had was the DOS MFA server fail open slide. In this case, I assume failed close should be implemented in the architecture. Is that a correct assumption? I mean, the, the answer to everything is going to be it depends. Um, right. Because in a closed scenario, you can totally yourself too so um, you want to be careful with that it's going to depend on the environment but um, yeah it, it, if you suspect anybody have the ability to um, change host files or, or anything like that then you'd want it to feel closed Great, great. So uh, I want to just let the audience know that there is a survey for this talk available the links in the chat um, if you have any further questions uh, you can, yeah, we actually have time right now if you want to throw them in the chat and get some live interaction. <clears throat> if not, the base will be available in chat afterwards. Yep. Okay, great, great. All right, well, thank you so much for presenting. This was an amazing talk and uh, it's something that I've been hearing about a lot personally through my people that I know in the, in the industry. So I love that you ended with the areas of research that you're looking into and you're encouraging others to do. And, and yeah. I think that's, I think that's really cool. Like you, you're, you're so knowledgeable about this subject and then you're looking at these different things that you want to see for the research in it. And you're sharing that with the community, like saying, Hey, these are some interesting things to look at. This is some research that can be done. Let's do this together. Let's, let's see where we can go with this. So Thank you so much. I thought that was a really cool thing to do. So, all right, all right. and uh, let's uh, everyone else stand by here. We have about eighteen minutes until the next presenter, um, but uh, we'll get someone on as soon as possible. Thank you so much.